good to see everybody tonight. God bless you so much. We are here at Life Church at South Mountain, 40th and Baseline, and we're recording this. Uh, we know that with the coronavirus and the epidemic, we know that we're not able to gather together, but I'm glad that you're here with us. Uh, I'm Pastor Greg, and we're just so glad that we're able to do this, and uh, I thank Ben for being able to help us, Ben Brown, and his uh, time that he's spending here helping me record this. I know at other locations around the church, we are recording our youth event um, and our youth um, minister, and then they're beginning to do a live stream on Facebook. And so we have different groups. They're recording now in the children's room, doing some children's recordings and stuff. So different things are going on around the campus, but we're here. And I know that this is a temporary thing, but I wanted you to stay involved as much as we can. I wanted you to join with us as we study the Word of God. I know that there's a lot of things that we do. We're busy with watching TV and everything else that's been going on, but we're getting a little bit rustless and a little stir-crazy. And so I wanted to get us back to a little bit of normal. And what I want to try to do is every Wednesday night we do walk through the Word and we just take some time. We take a book of the Bible and we walk through the Word and we take it Scripture by Scripture and study it. Normally, I would have an open discussion, and we would have questions and answers, and we try to have a little bit of verbiage between the congregation and myself, and, and we have question and answer times, and tonight's going to be a little bit different in that regard, because we don't have that capability just yet, but we're working on that. But I did want to start with us and be able to do this, so I'm going to ask you, if you would, to um, open your Bibles to with us. We're going to be able to start tonight and... Uh, we're going to be going to the book of Romans, the 10th chapter, and we have gone forward and we are starting tonight, going back just a few verses to pick up where we can lead into our study for tonight, and we are in verse 14, so if you have your Bibles, but before we get into the Word, we want to take just a few minutes to ask you to join with us in prayer. Um, uh, many of you know uh, we've sent out some prayer requests, um, Krista uh, Morrow just wanted to say God did a miracle for her. She had an accident, wrecked her car and totaled it, but uh, she was able to have enough money to be able to get a car so she could get some transportation. After she bought the car, she found out that it was um, all hoaxed and the car was not titled properly and the car had some engine problems and some things like that. She asked me and she said, Pastor, please pray um, that something would work out. As she was driving home, the car started shaking. She didn't know if she was even going to make it home. She had some help with uh, some family members that jumped in to help get it uh, to pass the missions. She was able to get things taken care of. And she called me this afternoon and said, praise the Lord. Tell the church, thanks for praying. Then my car's working and everything's going good. Sister Andrea was on her way to the hospital. I have not heard an update yet. Um, she has been sick again and she is just praying that uh, she doesn't... Take this virus. It's not uh, the symptoms that she has has been an ongoing problem with her digestive system, and she needs a, a, a touch and a healing from God. Uh, brother and sister Far are at home, and uh, they're uh, doing good, but they're just needing a touch, a fresh touch and strength. Uh, sister Lou was here with us in prayer last night, and she. Uh, we're just going to pray for her tonight that God would touch her. If you have a special need or a special request, please make sure that you let us know. You can go to our church website at lifechurchofgod.org. You can send those prayer requests through our prayer line. If you want to donate to the church and you feel impressed that you need to catch up with your tithe and your offering, don't let those things slack. Stay faithful to that. Um, you can do that through our online giving. If you want to mail your tithe uh, to the church, you can also do that. And uh, we thank you so much for your faithfulness uh, to our church and continuing to do that. I'm going to ask you if you would to bow your heads with me as we start this service with prayer. We pray for these that are sick and if you have a special need, I, one of the things that I have put together and I say this every time we pray at our church is we don't pray in hope, we pray and believe. The, the Bible teaches us and tells us to believe when we pray that we would receive. And tonight I want to tell you that one of the things that we can do is believe God. And if you have a need, I'm going to ask you to just put your faith with my faith and let's believe God for that miracle that we need. And I know God is already in control of this situation. We don't have to worry about it. 
I'm going to try to do my best to stay as focused as I can. But you know what? I believe God wants to reach through and touch and give a miracle. If you need a miracle tonight, God is still a miracle working God. And God can do a miracle tonight. Let's join our faith and let's believe God for that touch tonight. Would you join with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to come together again. I thank you, Lord, for uh, the answers to prayers that you have brought to our church, the healings of cancer and heart disease. God, the miracles that you have done in homes and families to restore and, and bring about. God, I know that you are a miracle-working God, and I thank you for that that you have done. I pray for Andrea Brown, God, right now. I pray that, Lord, though, though she's not here, that I can lay my hands on this, not an extension. You are everywhere at all times. You are with her right now in that hospital. And, God, you, I pray that you would touch her, minister your healing touch to her. God, I believe you for that. I thank you for the touch upon these that have been sick. And, and God, I thank you for the continuation of the healing. God, uh, of brother and sister Far, continue to strengthen their body. And I pray that you would ease the pain that they're in. And God, I just pray that you would help them to grow stronger. Uh, pray for God that you would touch Denise Beers. And God, continue the healing process with her. And Lord, we just thank you as you hold her hand and walk through the steps that she has to go through. Lord, we just pray and we're believing you tonight for your touch now upon uh, Sister Lou. God, continue to heal her and strengthen her body. And God, as Garrett always asks us to pray, we pray, God, tonight for the spirit of revival to hit and to touch, to move us to a place to where you want us to be. Help us to be caught up in the spirit and help the spirit of God to move in a mighty way. And we're going to thank you for that. We're going to believe you for that. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You have your Bibles tonight, you turn with me. We're in the book of Romans, the 10th chapter, if you're just joining in with us, and we want you to go to verse 14. There's two things that you'll need in our Bible study, and I tell people, they've asked me, they said, Pastor, can I have an outline? I need an outline of what you're teaching. Well, you can have my outline, it's called the Bible, and we're starting in Romans, the 10th chapter, and we're verse 14. And if you want to walk along with me, you might need a notepad to be able to scratch down some ideas, some questions. If you have a question, you can let us know. You can text me at 602-770-7922, or you can uh, make your comments known uh, on, the, uh, on the website there if you want to, or send it through um, our website, and I'll do my best to answer them. But we want to get into the Word tonight. In Romans, the, 14th, uh, uh, the 10th chapter, in verse 14, it says, And then, uh, how then shall they call on him who, who they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? If you look on that particular section of Scripture, I know that a lot of times we look at that Scripture and we begin to think about the idea that a preacher is one who stands behind this pulpit. But we are all called to be preachers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe that we live the preaching effort and we make that effort. One of the things that I tell people is, is that my comment to them is that we make the word known. We preach the gospel by the way we live and what we do. The hardest thing for us to realize is that we wait for a preacher to be one who has a title or a plaque on their wall or a certificate to say that they're preaching. Your certificate was given to you when you accepted the blood of Jesus Christ to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, to tell the transition of everything that he's done for you. One of the things that we work at and we try to do is to tell people, you preach the gospel everywhere you go. Everything that you do and say. When we preach the gospel, we make a bold proclamation of who he is and what he has done. The Bible says in verse 15, it says, And how then, how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. Out of Isaiah, the 57th chapter, in verse 7, um, we see Paul quoting the scripture to let us know where he refers to this. Paul is teaching and this church at Rome, to many of them that are Jews. And he also is teaching to those Israelites that were there, but he's also teaching to some Gentiles that were a part of this congregation in Rome that was a very mixed group. And as Paul writes in this particular letter to encourage the church there at Rome, he begins to instruct them about this idea. Quoting this scripture was one to give reference to it. And we know that he's not speaking particularly about the idea of the feet uh, of the gospel, but he's talking about going to do. The message of, of the gospel is not just to be one that sits upon it, 
but God prepares and gives us the ability to go. We've used this and quoted this scripture for many years, and many times we have quoted this scripture about world missions. But how many of you realize to go simply means that you go outside of your house, you go outside of where you're living and preach it and teach it at the places you go and the different areas that you go to? It's, it's a very important part for us to realize that they are sent. I wish that I could get each one of you this co confirmation to say, you are sent to preach the gospel. You are called to preach the gospel. And I want to tell you that we preach it every time that we can. The next verse, verse 16 in Romans, the 10th chapter, and verse 16 says, But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed the report of the Lord? I, I'm reminded when we were reading this and I was studying this afternoon, I, I was looking at that particular uh, phrase there. It says, Lord, who has believed our report? And when I looked at that, I was reminded of a song that uh, Ron Cannoli uh, recorded a few years ago on the Majestic label. And uh, some of you will, uh, the Majesty label, if you will. And, and he recorded a song, Whose Report Will You Believe? And he says, uh, when he was beginning to sing that song, he says, whose report will you believe? Whose report will you believe? And he asked that question over and over again. And I ask you tonight, whose report will you believe? The report that we have is the report of the Lord. And he said, whose report will you believe? Uh, and what is the report of the Lord? The Bible says, and, and, and that speaks of the volumes of, of the power of God and the presence of God. His report is good in his report. The, uh, Ron says this in his song, and I want to, th this is the, the label that he says, but he says, his report says, I am healed. His report says, I am filled. His, the, uh, the report of the Lord says, I am free. The report of the Lord says, victory. And right now, tonight, I ask you this question. Whose report will you believe? What report are you listening to? Are you listening to the report of the, of the world and the skepticism of the world that says we're to be afraid and do we, need to be, we need to be fearful of all these things around us and we need to be afraid to go outside or we need to pray? I mean, we've got to be smart, but we've also got to realize that by the power of Jesus Christ and by His stripes, I am healed. By the power of His blood, the blood of Jesus Christ, I am filled with the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. I am free from the chains of bondage from my past. And I have victory in Jesus' name. Whose report tonight do you believe? Are you believing the report of the Lord? And are you standing in the confirmation of that? Or are you surrounded by the boundaries of the enemy who tries to control you and to destroy you and hold your environment together? When we come together, one of the things that we shout about is the, is the freedom that God brings and the freedom to run, the freedom to jump, the freedom to shout. Oh, that God would speak to us to let us know that we quit listening to the report of the world and we listen to the report of God and His Word and the promises that God speaks to us in, in the volumes of these pages. That's His report. And the report of the Lord is one that we stand on when we come to that place. If you will, go with me now. We're in verse 17 of the 10th chapter. It says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. When we think about the idea of hearing, I oftentimes tell you we don't just hear with our ears, we hear with our heart. We understand with our brain and the comprehension of what we hear. But faith comes by believing the Word of God and putting that Word into our practice. You see, I can read this like a book and never comprehend by faith the promises that are in it. But because I believe this and because I believe that by His stripes I am healed, because I believe the promise that He made that, that we can pray over the sick and they would recover, because I believe that and because I have read that and I understand what Paul is trying to tell the church there, he is trying to get them to understand that when we read the Scripture and we apply it, it's not just hearing it, it's believing it. Because that's what faith is. We know that faith in, in Hebrews tells us it's the evidence of things hoped for. Uh, it's the very idea of believing God. The evidence of it means that we already believe when we pray. We have faith enough to have confidence and assurance that God is with us. Hearing the Word of God and, and just taking it in, 
You can sit there tonight and you can play it on a CD or whatever you want to do. Just hearing the Word of God is not enough. You've got to have faith to apply the Word of God to your life. The transformation happens when we just read it and then when we begin to, begin to apply it to our life. It's very difficult for, for the transition of, of words to be spoken. Hearing is something that we do with our ears. But we, I was watching as they were talking about the coronavirus on TV in the last few days, and I've been very entertained with the, the women that are standing there on the side of those that are speaking doing sign language. I don't have the ability to do it. Uh, I, I wish I could. Uh, my wife has a little bit of ability to do some sign language, and my daughter Brittany studied it a little bit in school. But when I watch them do that, you know there are people that can't hear with their ears, but they have the understanding through another way. And no matter how you are receiving the Word of God, it's not just enough to hear it. It's when you begin to have faith to believe it. That's when it changes your life. When you hear the Word of God, you will never be the same. It's the transforming power of the promises. The Bible says, know the Word and the Word will set you free. That truth in the Word, that promise of God, those are the things that we stand upon. When I look down a, a little bit further, I begin to see that Paul begins to reiterate those points and bring those points to be. Verse 18 says, but I say, ha have they not heard? And yes, indeed, their sound has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. When Paul begins to describe that, he's talking about the message of the gospel, both the message of the goodness of Christ and how he got about it. Yes, indeed, the confirmation of it. But I say, did Israel not know? First, Moses says, I will provoke you to jealousy by those who are not a nation. I will move you to anger by a foolish nation. The jealousy that happened was the fact that there was much conflict in many of the churches in the early church. And as Paul was preaching, there was much conflict in the fact the Jews were not willing to really accept the Gentile. And there was much conflict in the nature of that. Paul begins to address that in the conflict that's there. Many of us in our church, if we grow up in the church, sometimes we have a conflict when somebody comes to know the Lord and they begin to grow because they're hungry and they begin stir crazy. It's easy for us to begin to be judgmental and we become uh, name calling or pointing fingers or finding fault or conflict with it. But I will tell you this, if we're not careful, we're going to be provoked to anger because God will bless those. The Bible says when we're hungry and thirsty, we will be filled. And one of the things that God is requiring of us is that we stay hungry in the word. When Paul was teaching this to the, to the church there in Rome. He begins to tell them of, the, of what happened and how and the, and the reason that God began to pour His Spirit out upon the Gentiles because the, the Jews, the Israelites, had, had rejected the message of Christ. They wouldn't accept it. Many of them had, had been to the point to where they wouldn't accept anybody outside of, of the Jewish faith. That they thought that this was just for the Jews, just for the Gentiles. Uh, but the power of God was there and the power of God moved upon them and they began to see that. That's why Isaiah in the, in the 20th verse there, he says, But Isaiah is very bold and says, I have found by those who did not seek me. He said, I was found. This is the Lord speaking to Isaiah and letting the children of Israel know this. And he said, but I was found by those who did not seek me. I was made manifest to those who did not ask for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. You see, it got to the place to where all that Israel wanted to do was say, look, Let's do the legal things. Let's do the law. Let's jump through the hoops. Let's do the, the routine that we need to do. Let's, let's keep this standard going. And sometimes we see that as long as we keep this standard of the law going and we try to do all the right things, that we'll be good enough. And, and, and I, somewhere along the line, we've got to realize that God is not looking at the nature of whether we can be perfect. He's whether, whether we can look at him and begin to say, he's my hope and he's my help. 
You see, when, when he speaks to this, he begins to say that there were those who did not necessarily ask for him. The Gentiles were not, they didn't understand all this. They were amazed at how that the power of God was being poured out upon them and the presence of God was being poured into them. God was giving opening up through the cross of Jesus Christ and through the power of God setting forth the church in the book of Acts. We read that how God had set forth from Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the world. And he begins to commission all of the church to go. And as they were scattered out and, and the, the enemy did everything he could to divert and to scatter the church. And the, the, the Bible says the church went everywhere. But as they were scattered, one of the things that was happening is, is the message of Jesus Christ was touching all these lives. I believe that through this coronavirus, the devil thought, now if I can just get them to separate, if I can just get them to isolate, if I can just get them to stay home, I can keep them from, from seeing and being able to be the church and being effective for it. But I'm going to tell you something, through the power of the airways, through technology and some of the things, the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ is being preached in a broader perspective than it's ever been. We actually had so many people on YouTube and Facebook and all the other things, all the messages that it overwhelmed it. I'm going to tell you something. Tonight, there are messages going out of hope and help. And, and one of the things that we're seeing is this gospel message is being preached to people that don't necessarily know it, but they're flipping on the, the TV or the YouTube and they go to a channel and accidentally they may run across it. But it's not accidental. It's on purpose because God designed it and God had a plan years in the making of how this technology would be used to spread the gospel. And though the enemy tried to avert it and to keep the gospel, can, uh, to, to separate us and to put us in isolation, I think it's great that we can tune in together tonight and study God's word and see the power of God speak through the airways and speak to us as a church. As we look at this, let's move on. We're going to go on down to chapter 11 now. And if you will, we're in chapter 11 of Romans, verse 1. It says, and, and I say then... Has God cast away his people? Certainly not, Paul answers. For I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham and of the tribe of, of Benjamin. Paul identifies himself as, as, as I am no different than you are. And Paul was just like they are. Maybe in your past you were just like them. Maybe there was a time in your life before you encountered Christ that you were uh, uh, overly religious and exhorted in your effort and you, you were exonerating others because they couldn't live up to the standard of it. I'm going to tell you this. I believe with all my heart that God's arms are open to love this lost and dying world. And they're not going to come in perfect and they're not going to come in righteous. But we were all sinners saved by grace. And we came from somewhere out of the wretchedness of sin to be set free by the power of Jesus Christ. And we've all got a story to tell and we've all got a testimony to make. And it's time that we as the church continues to do so. When we look at this particular section of Scripture, Paul identifying himself as what tribe he was from, from the tribe of Benjamin, from the, from the seed of Abraham, identifying himself as an Israelite. But he says, God has not cast away his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know that the Scripture says of Elijah how he pleads with God? Lord, they have killed, all, killed your prophets and torn down your altars, and, and I alone am left to seek my life. He goes on and he says, the, the scripture where Elijah is speaking this is found in 1 Kings, the 19th chapter, verses uh, 10 and, and 14, when Elijah is trying to convince God, and he's trying to tell God of all the the problems, and he's the only one left. I'm, oh, poor pitiful Paul. I'm all, sorry, I didn't mean to hit my microphone for those of you who are listening. Oh, poor pitiful Paul. He was all alone. It was just him. And, and, and sometimes we get to that place. Elijah was saying, oh, poor pitiful me. Come on, sometimes we think that we're the only spiritual ones left in the world. We think we're the only ones living. But I'm going to tell you something. God spoke and began to tell the prophet, though he was faithful, he ran in fear. He ran with the fear of Jezebel, and he ran to get away from Jezebel. And I don't know about you, but you may be trying to run from God in fear tonight. You may be trying to run from your problems and your circumstances. You may be confused and not sure of what's going to take place. 
I'm going to tell you something. God has a remnant. Amen. God has a remnant. He has a purpose. And he goes on in verse 4 and he says, But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed their knee to Baal. There are people that, listen, that are, that are not, they're not kneeling to the, the world's pressure. They're not folding to the pressures of, of society to be accepted. They're not folding to the acceptance of, the, of, of what the world says is, you have to do this to be accepted. I believe with all my heart it's time that the church realizes we don't have to be compared to the worldly things to reach the lost. What the, the world knows is how bad it is. They need to see a church that's separate and unique, that's holy and spiritual and righteous. That's what the world is looking for. Somebody who's truly different. Somebody who's truly unique and stands up for the gospel. When we look at this, we begin to realize a little bit differently how Elijah is then told that God says, I have 7,000. There, there may be a handful. Maybe you're one of those tonight who says, God is still faithful. God is still true. And I'm going to stand up for the promises of God. No matter what comes against me, I'm going to see the power of God work in a mighty way. Verse 5 and says, even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. There's a remnant according to the election of grace. That word remnant means that a, a few of many. Now there's a lot of people, I, I, as we've watched the numbers of the world, the ups and downs of this disease, they show the millions and, uh, of people across this globe. There are people that literally... I, I, by the millions that are contracting this virus. There are people in isolated areas that are contracting this virus. And, and sometimes we think about this idea of being this remnant. This I'm one of the few, I'm one of the isolated. But I can, I'm going to tell you something. We're all being affected by this, and we're all being affected by it. I'm going to ask you, are you one of the few that stands with God? Are you one of the few that will stand faithful to God? Because Bible says that according to the election of grace, it's not that God chose to grace a few and pardon a few. As we read earlier in our study in Romans, we, we saw and we learned about how that grace is God's gift to man through the uh, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Grace is not something we earn. Grace is given freely. By, it is a gift from God. If we, as you read it here in, in verse 6, it says, and If by grace, then it is no longer works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace. Otherwise, work is no longer work. Paul, in a confusing way, tells us that it's not by works that we are saved. He says it a little clearer in the book of Ephesians as he writes the letter to the church at Ephesus. And he begins to write, in chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, he says, For by grace are you saved, through faith, and not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works. Least anyone should boast. I'm going to tell you tonight, it's not how good you can live, or it's by grace. It's the grace that saved it. We are saved by that amazing grace. How sweet the sound, that grace that saved a wretch like me. When I look at the grace of God and I begin to see that, we realize that Paul was trying to tell the, 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 the Israelites that were there in that congregation and let them know you're, you're, you are saved by grace and we are all saved by grace. It is God's grace that saves any of us. If you stop long enough tonight and think about this, remember where God saved you from? Remember the work of that grace that God did for you? Remember the time when God took the time to find you and reach down to a low spot where he sent that, where he saved you and brought you out? You see, it's that grace that God gives to us. One of my favorite scriptures is found in Romans 6 and 23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. You see, that gift that he gives us is that hope that we are saved. And it is that gift of grace that gives us that hope. We, we can't earn it, and you can't earn the grace of God by being good enough or paying enough or doing enough. The way that you earn grace and the way that you receive grace is by faith in Jesus Christ, by faith in something that is bigger than you and more powerful than you. 
We, uh, we need to understand that grace is not something that you can purchase or buy. It's something that you attain by faith. By faith we are saved. By faith we receive the work that He does in us to redeem us. We can't save ourselves, but God can through His grace. We'll move on in verse 7. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. I want you to look at this because that particular Paul begins to talk about, in a few verses earlier, he was talking about listening and hearing. He's talking about the senses that we receive the gospel through. Here he's talking about the idea of being blinded, and he talks about our sight, and he begins to uh, uh, approach it by the, the idea of what we see and how we see the gospel. And he uses that, and he says, uh, in verse 8 it says, And just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear to this very day. And David said, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a recompense to them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they do not see and bow and bow down their back always. The idea of this and the nature of that Paul is trying to show us is that we can be so blinded by our, by our religion that we miss the relationship opportunity that we have with Jesus Christ. There are a lot of people that think they're going to get to heaven through religion, and it's not through religion. You can do religion, but you'll miss the relationship that Jesus Christ has for you. He wants to walk with you and talk with you. He wants to live with you. He's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He will never leave you nor forsake you. And tonight, if you're struggling with this and if you're struggling through the isolation and the problems and the things that you're going through, know this, that you have a friend that will stick closer than a brother to you. You have a relationship that he can have with you. you it's not through religion. It's not uh, showing up and doing all the functions of the church and what the church says. It is obeying and believing and walking walking daily with Jesus Christ. We look at this and Paul begins to talk about this idea of this relationship that you can have and he shares with them this nature of this stumbling block because I can tell you there are people that have become so religious and they're so righteous in their religion that they miss the opportunity to reach out to others in relationships. One of the greatest things that I like about Life Church here is, and I, I love our people, but one of the best things we have is I believe that we are a very relational church. We have young people, we have children, we, we have a, a generation, we have old folks. I'll, I'll put myself in that category if that's okay. I know I'm not as old as some. Uh, Larry Farr, if you're watching, you know I'm talking to you. But there are some folks that are older than I am. There are some folks that are a lot younger than I am. I'm not even in the middle. We have people from all kinds of different walks, of, of, but we, we've, we've found a way to love, to bridge a gap between the generations. I, I, I'm, I'm, I watch our brother Larry Farr, and he, he's, uh, Larry, I'm going to try to hit your age at 84, but Larry will come every Sunday. He packs his pockets now, I know these last few weeks we haven't been able to do that, and I guess that's probably what I miss most about my church family is seeing these kind of things. But Larry will come with his pockets packed with candy for the kids. And when he pulls in the parking lot, they run to find him. They run to catch him. They'll run to him, and he'll pass out candy to the kids, and he gives them that, and he'll give them a word of encouragement, tell them that God loves them and that they need to behave and listen to their moms and dads, and, and he'll send them away. And we have teenagers that... Uh, a couple weeks ago, we were setting up some things. We're getting ready to go to two services in our church. And so we, we've had some of our work crews have, have become that. We've adjusted our schedule, and we're trying to make changes and plans. And one of the things that we're out there doing, I saw the teenagers. They were helping my wife set up some tables. And they were, there were some that were helping at our greeters booth. And there were some that were helping in different areas of the church. And I, I said, Lord, this is the most beautiful thing. Because when we get to heaven, there's going to be young and old. There's going to be black and white. There's going to be, uh, there's going, we're going to be different colors of skins. And, and, but the thing is, God, we're going to be all one in you. And I, I think that if we can learn to see the church be that today, that's what I believe you're looking for, God, is that we take our blinders off. 
We don't look down at someone because they're young. We don't look down at someone because they've come from a, a difficult part of life and they've come from a background that's difficult. We're all working our way through this thing. We're all following Jesus Christ to get the help and the hope that we need. As we look, we continue in verse 11. He says, I say then, have I stumbled that they should fall? Certainly not. But through their fall to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. The thing that, that, that's happening and the, the, the words that are getting around the globe, people around the, the world are hearing this. We've tried to uh, make this an, an English thing and we've tried to make this a, an American thing. And we've tried to make this, but this is something that's affecting the whole globe. It's all over the world. And everyone needs the gospel message. I love it when our missionaries come back and talk about how God is opening up doors in different nations and different places. You see, I believe that God is wanting this gospel to be preached in all nations. What better way to do this through the live streams and through the uh, messages on YouTube and, and Facebook, getting them out there and letting the world hear about this passage of Scripture, this work of God. We can't get jealous sitting on our religious haunches and sitting about here and sitting here. Uh, we can, our, you know, we're not the frozen chosen, if you will. We're not isolated. We're not the only ones. We're not the, the only ones that are going to get this message. We've got to realize that God is wanting us to reach a lost and dying world with the gospel message of Jesus Christ. When Paul was speaking here to the, to, to the Israelites, he was simply telling them, he said, it, it is not that we alone walk in this. And the stumbling block was as they were trying to create the atmosphere that the Gentiles had to be just as religious as the, as the Jews who grew up in this thing. They had to do the ceremonial things and they had to do the ceremonial righteousness and they had to do all the, the fulfillment of the law. And Paul was trying to say, hey, wait a minute. That's not what it is. You see, I believe this with all my heart. That there is a standard that we must live by. But we've got to be, and I believe this is, is the work of Christ, and I believe one of the things that Christ teaches us and tells us this, is that we have got to love the sinner. We hate the sin, but we love the sinner. Because listen, this is not a church. It's not, we, God's not got His church here to be one that just sits with a bunch of righteous people on Sunday morning. It's a place and it's a hospital to heal the sick. It's a place to heal the broken. It's a place to set free those that are ca held captive. This is what the church is all about, is getting that purpose. And Paul is trying to tell them, you sit on your haunches as Jews and you rejected the work and the message of what Christ came to do. And now you're trying to do the same thing to these Gentiles who are receiving this gospel and God has chosen to pour it out to people who are looking for an opportunity. God is looking for a people who want to look for the message of Jesus Christ. That's where I would encourage you to amen me if you were here, but since you're not, I'm sure you're doing that at home. Uh, and if you are, just let us know. <laughs> if we will, let's go on to verse 12. We're moving on just a little bit tonight. It says, now, if their uh, fall is riches for the world, the failure riches is for the Gentile. How much more for their fullness? As we look at this particular thought, he begins to speak to that engraftingness. For now he turns his conversation from the Jew to the Gentile. He says, for I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. He says, if by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are of my flesh, those that are, that are the Israelites, to save some, if their being cast away is, is the reconciling of the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? He goes on and he uses some examples of some, some spiritual analogies, if you will. And he uses, he says, for if the first fruit is holy... The lump is holy. He says, for if the root is holy, so are the branches. We've got to build off the basis of one thing. And I believe that Paul is trying to tell the church there at Rome that they have got to have a foundation that is productive. That foundation is on the belief of Jesus Christ. 
We're coming up to a season uh, of Palm Sunday, and then we know that Resurrection Sunday is right around the corner as we come into this season. And I, I so long for this time because one of the things that I believe it's to reiterate and remind us that we have that is the foundation that makes the church the church is that we believe that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin that he walked among us with his disciples and he preached and, and taught the word of God and he and he gave the message of hope to a world that needs hope and then he gave himself willingly upon a cross being punished and crucified for no sin that he had committed but was crucified for my sin and your sin that's the basis and the foundation that Paul says that drives me to preach to the Gentiles, that drives me with the purpose. And he says that foundation is solid, that foundation. We know in 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, Paul refers again to this leaven. And he says a little a leaven ruins the whole lump and a little sin, if you will. And that leaven is given as sin. But he says if the whole fruit, if the beginning of it is good, if it is true, it will be fine. We realize the idea of this as Paul begins to go on and define it. Chapter 11 here in Romans, the 17th verse, he says, If some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive tree, were engrafted in among them, and, and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. He's speaking there to the fact that the Gentiles then were beginning to get haughty and begin to get, look, I mean, it's, it's like we were choosing sides. Well, you did this. Well, you did this. And they were pointing fingers and calling each other to say this. Well, we were here first and, and that, that's fine. Well, we've been engrafted in, so we're special. We're, we're, we're from this side and we're from that side. Aren't you? I just wish that the church and I wish that the, the denominations and everything about these beliefs, I wish that we would all get back to the basics of what we need and know to do. We're all saved by grace. We're all saved by that. It's not of our works. And the purpose of the church is so that we can, can reach out in love to touch and minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. When we look at this engraftingness that he's talking about there, one of the things that they would do when they would take a wild olive tree was to begin to produce that olive that they wanted, a different flavor, a different color, a different taste, a different type. They would take a wild olive tree and they would engraft it into the, the, the solid, good uh, producing olive tree so that it would produce in multiple flavors and multiple styles, that it would grow in a different brand and a different style. What God was trying to do is he said, I don't want you to all be alike. I want you to know this. God said, but we're all engrafted into the body of Christ. We're all part of it because that's what supports us all is him. I know that the gospel of John, when Paul talks about it, we are the vine and he, uh, we are the branches and he is the vine and we are supported by that. The nature of that is, is that when, it, when we realize the work of Jesus Christ and what he is, it's all based in him. Verse 19 says, the branches were broken off that I may be engrafted. Verse 20 says, well said because of unbelief you were broken off and you stand by faith, not by haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. You see, even if we've been saved by grace, we've all, we're, we're all sinners. And sometimes in our nature of transformation, we begin to judge others that are coming along behind us. We begin to find critical points to point out their faults and flaws. Their flaws are going to be different than ours. They may have grown up in a different path and they may be struggling a different way. But our job is not to judge them. Our job is to love them. And we're going to change the world. We're going to love them into the kingdom of Christ. We're going to love them through this. It's important for us to realize that it is not by the nature of our own goodness. Paul doesn't speak about that. But that's why it's important for us to recognize the goodness of God and the faithfulness of who he is. When we look at this, we begin to realize that God did not 
cut us off to kill us, but he cut us off so that he could transform us. Sometimes God will take some shaking in our lives to make us realize that we still need to depend on him. There's some things that he does in our life so that we will turn to him and not away from him. When God speaks to us, he speaks to us in such a way that we'll know his nature and who he is. I want to finish here tonight in the next few verses. So if you're about finished, as Paul begins to wrap this up about talking about the engraftedness of those that are given. Verse 22 says, Therefore, consider the goodness and the severity of God on those who fell. Severity, uh, but if you will, he goes, but towards you, goodness, if you continue in his goodness, otherwise you will be cut off. And they also, that they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. The Bible says that we can repent and do our first works over. Repentance is what God asks of us. It is not perfection, but repentance. David, when he, was, when he had betrayed God and he had disobeyed God, went down a path of disobedience. God spoke to him, trying to get him to change. But it wasn't until he was encountered by his friend, Nathaniel, that he came to him and, and told him that he's going to have to change his ways and he's going to have to get it right. Brought his eyes to be open so that he could realize that he had to change. It was repentance. And Psalms 51 speaks to it. When David cried out and said, Lord, create in me a clean heart, O God, and remove my sins from me. When David cried out in Psalms 51, he was crying out in repentance, saying, God, forgive me. No matter where you are, no matter what you've done, it's a repented heart that God looks for. Tonight, as we close tonight, we just take these last few minutes. I want to tell you something. If you're listening to this and you're wrestling with some things in your life, Give them to God. Don't hold on to them. If you've been hurt through church, maybe you've been hurt through some people who, who spoke mean to you or did evil by you. Remember, they're struggling too. I, I want to tell you this tonight. It's time that you just lay that down and say, God, would you forgive me? Would you renew in me that right spirit? Create in me, God, that clean heart. Lord, right now, I'm just going to ask if we would across this, these, these radio waves and this TV, if you're sitting there in front of your TV, I'm just going to ask you to bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, you know each of us. God, there are those tonight that, that as we were teaching this tonight, I know that their hearts were touched. I felt the Holy Spirit even as we were praying and, and preparing for this. God, I didn't come tonight to speak down to anyone or at anyone. I came tonight to say I am one of them. I'm just another one who was engrafted in. I'm just another one who was lost, but that grace that found me. And Heavenly Father, I pray that as I move forward in my faith, that I continue to reach out. That I don't reach beyond or look beyond what you're doing, but Heavenly Father, use this time. Take these few moments, God, see our hearts, and surrender them to you. I pray, Lord, across this this congregation, across these, these that are watching and these that are there with us. Heavenly Father, I pray. I pray that, God, we would stand up and say, Lord, use me to preach this message of a loving Savior who came and died for me. Lord, I love you tonight. I thank you for your word. I pray that you would be with each of us. Lord, as we, Lord, go through our, the, the next few days, as we go through the motions of our life and, I, and the emotions and the minutes and the days and the hours, as we become frustrated, God, with each other and we become frustrated with the circumstances that surround us, I pray that you would give us a purpose and a plan. God, give us a reason. Speak to our hearts. Use us, O oh God. Let your presence and your power be that that you do for us. We ask it, we thank you for it. In Jesus' wonderful and precious name, amen and amen. God bless you. Don't forget, listen, as I said it earlier, we'll be having our normal praise and worship time. If you want to join us on Sunday morning at 11 a.m. right here on this channel at lifechurchofgod.org, 
If you want to give to the church, again, you can give online or you can also mail your tithe in to 4001 East Baseline Road, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, 85042. We'd love to hear from you if you want to call us at 602-770-7922. Let us know what God is doing in your life. Let us know if we can pray with you about anything. We love you. We're standing with you through this. God be with you. In Jesus' name, amen.